Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to another episode of Glass Half Full, a podcast and a safe platform where we talk with a variety of teachers, entrepreneurs, spiritualists, uplifters, givers, shakers, and serenaders. Everyone has a lesson to learn and a lesson to share. Let's use our life experiences to enrich someone's heart, mind, spirit, and soul. Through sharing our experiences, we can be a learning inspiration for one another. I'm your host, Chris Levins. Let's welcome today's guest. Today's guest is Liam Naden. Speaker, teacher, writer, and researcher, Liam Naden helps you understand the process of creating true success in your life by understanding how to use your brain the right way, overcoming your problems, achieving your goals, and ending frustrations. Let's give a warm welcome to Liam Naden. Good morning, Hello, good Chris. morning. Good morning. How are you today? Thanks for having me here. I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. We're so pleased that you could take some time out to be a guest here on Glass Half Full. So thank you very much. Thank you. It'll be exciting, I'm sure. Yeah. To me, anyway. <laughs> I know you're on the other side of the table this time, right? Which is cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to jump right in. I like to ask all of my guests this first question. I believe that our lives are in spiritual design. Can you share your life layout or blueprint with everyone? How you grew up, where, your family lifestyle? Okay, sure. Well, I was born in New Zealand and lived there most of my life. And I was born into a very uh, devout Catholic family. And I'm the eldest of eight children. My father apparently said that uh, he'd heard that the Pope had, had sent out an instruction to all Catholics, to all Catholic men, saying, come on, lads, we've got to outbreed the Protestants. <laughs> so... <laughs> so he said he did his duty before finding out that the Pope hadn't said that at all. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, and I was brought up in Auckland and, and lived most of my life in, in Auckland, New Zealand. And um, after school, I went to university because I've always been a student of success, if you like, even from an earlier stage. And um, I started off thinking religion might have the answer. And I, I was very devoutly Catholic and, and studied the, the church teachings and and was told that how to be successful is, is simple. You decide what you want and you ask God. You pray to God and God will give you what you want. Mm -hmm. So I tried that. In fact, I remember as a young child, when I was about 10 or 11, going to, school, uh, going to church every morning for a month at 7 in the morning mass to 7 in the morning mass in the middle of winter, saying, I'm going to test God on this one. I'm going to see if this works, if he's true to his word. So I'm going to ask him for something. And I can't quite remember what it was. I think it was to win a competition at school, something like that. And I thought, I'm going to ask for this to see if it works. Well, I didn't get it, what I was asking <laughs> for. So I began to think, well, maybe this theory of just praying and asking for what you want, maybe it's, it's not really that effective. And when I looked around at my parents, my teachers, the other people in my community, I thought, well, these people aren't actually any more successful or happy than anyone else in the world. So Maybe it's not quite the answer. So I really went through a succession of different areas looking for the answer. How can I be happy and successful? And after religion, I tried education because I was told, well, if you want to be successful and happy, you need to have an education. Mm -hmm. And so I went to university for seven years full time and I studied music, wow. actually. And although I became very knowledgeable and it was great fun, I really enjoyed it. And, um, I noticed that I wasn't a lot happier. I wasn't feeling a lot more successful. And my teachers and the other people at un the university, sure, they knew a lot. But again, they didn't seem to be any happier or more successful than anyone else. And they still had problems and I still had problems. So I thought this isn't the answer. So I had an uncle actually who gave me the idea. And he said, if you want to be happy and successful, you need to set up your own business go into business for yourself, make lots of money, and then you can do all the things you want to do and, and you'll be successful. So that's what I did. And in my mid-20s, pretty well straight from university, I set up my own business. 
And it was the first of many businesses that I had. I've had 18 different businesses, actually, in my wow. life. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of them successful, but a lot of them were. Hmm. And, um, but, and I did become successful on the outside. But what I noticed was, even though I was making lots of money and I was <clears throat> doing really nice things and I was able to buy a nice house and all those sorts of things, I wasn't that happy. and I didn't really feel that successful. In fact, I felt stressed a lot of the time, and I was—I found my life was full of problems, stress, dealing with crises. You know, the typical entrepreneurial curse, if you if you like. And I began to think, well, maybe this is what life's about. Maybe all of the things that I've heard that life's supposed to be a struggle, life is hard, and you have to overcome obstacles. That's what success is. And and the, the more obstacles you overcome. The stronger you will be, and the more and the more successful you'll become. Now, I've since discovered none of those things are true from a biological or even a logical perspective, mm-hmm. but that's what I was led to believe. And then I went down the the whole personal development, self help, um, self improvement route, and I went to seminars all over the world, thinking because the promise there was, well, if you learn my technique, or if you do what I say, or if you follow my example from these from the gurus as it were then you can have everything you want and you can be truly happy and successful so i really tried hard on that front and i went to as i said went to seminars all over the world i went to uh, I, I read books all sorts of books i took courses i listened to all sorts of personal motivational tapes and recordings and hypnosis type tapes to you know, reprogram your subconscious mind and change your thoughts and change your beliefs. And I did goal setting and motivation and all of these things. And again, I noticed it wasn't really quite working for me because I still had lots of stress and problems. And people I met at the seminars, they had lots of stress and problems as well. And I started to get a bit bit disillusioned at this point, but then I tried some spiritual techniques and I got into spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I learned meditation and working with crystals and, excuse me, doing all sorts of spiritual practices. But the same result, I ended up still having lots of problems, lots of stress. And I thought, oh, well, this is just the way life is. It's unrealistic to keep chasing success and believing that you can achieve a life where you really feel in control of it and you're happy without problems. You know, maybe just problems are a part of life and you're never going to feel in control. Mm-hmm. But I thought, well, I'm still going to keep trying. And by this stage, I was in my mid forties and I was pretty successful on the outside. I had multiple homes, multiple businesses, things are going pretty well, but I was pretty stressed. But then something happened, which really with all of my knowledge of how to create success in life, I had all of the techniques, all of the knowledge, all of the ways to to do things. Something happened that should never have happened, and that was I lost everything, and I went from being a multimillionaire to being homeless. Mm. And I literally, I literally had to move in and sleep on the sofa in the in the small apartment of with my elderly mother. You know, she wow. was in her seventies, and she was still having to go out to work to pay for my food, virtually. Wow! <laughs> wow! So it's a bit of a crazy situation when I think back on it, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened because what it really did was set me in a different direction in mm. my life. And because I remember thinking, you know, this really shouldn't have happened to me given that I know how to set goals and achieve them or I've got all the information which says how you how you do it. Um, it's not working for me and I don't know what to do. But my my life did go in a completely different direction really in the sense that Rather than chasing success and struggling to achieve, things started to come to me. Opportunities started to come to me. The right people started to come to me to do things. Not only that was that made me successful and were businesses that I business opportunities that I could create and um, make successful and make all of the money I needed and wanted and do the things I really wanted to do. But the most amazing part of it all was. I didn't feel stressed. I didn't have problems. And for the first time in my life, I'm starting to feel I am actually in, I feel like life is under control. I feel truly happy. I wake up in the mornings feeling excited rather than 
dreading opening my inbox mm. <laughs> <laughs> to see what all the problems of, of, of my life are, are, are about to reveal themselves to me, as it were. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, I really want to figure this out. What am I doing? What am I doing differently? What's, why is this working? How is it working? Because I desperately, well, not desperately, but I definitely wanted to know what it was because I wanted to make sure I kept doing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I wanted, of course. And I didn't want to stop. I thought I need to figure this out. And that's really what led me a, 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 down a great rabbit hole, really, <clears throat> to understand that the key to everything we get in our life is actually between our ears and our brain. And that's what I do these days is, is share this knowledge with people, what I've learned from both experience and from research and through my observation and help of other people, um, that the key is the brain and how it works. Wow, nice, nice. That was a <laughs> variety roller spread. Coaster. Yeah, no, but we like we like a good roller coaster. We like a good roller coaster. So, what are the four parts of the brain, and how do they work together to give us the results we get in our life? <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. Sure. Well. What I've created is a fairly simple model about how the brain works. And this is all based on my research into, into the science of the brain and also joining the, the dots together and putting it in a simple format that people can understand. But I think there's a couple of really important things to realize bef- before I explain what the four parts are. Mm-hmm. And that's just, <clears throat> and that's just <clears throat> excuse me, the most important thing to realize is who you are and what your brain actually is. Okay. Because I went, when I couldn't figure out what I was doing right and what I'd been doing wrong, I went back to the basics and I thought, well, I'm going to ask myself, who am I and why am I here? Okay. And that's a fairly dramatic question to ask. And of course, thousands of books and philosophers throughout history and people throughout history have tried to figure that one out. <laughs> but I thought, but thought, well, all that aside, there's one thing I know for sure, and that is I live in a biological body and I live in a biological world. So is there anything about my biology or my physical existence that I can say is my, has a purpose? And, of course, if you ask a biological scientist, he will, he will say, yes, you have a purpose biologically, and that's to survive and thrive. We've probably all heard that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so the biological purpose we will have is to be the best that we can be to ensure not only our survival, but the survival of the species, the human race. And this is what we share with all life. All, all, all life, whatever species it is, has that same purpose. And it's geared up and, and designed to su- do its best to survive and thrive. So that's what we're here to do. But it's not just physically that being your best, being your strongest, your healthiest, which means you have the best chance of survival. But it's also your best mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Mm. In other words, it's being the happiest that you can be because that gives you the greatest chance of survival, actually. It's when you're, when you're your happiest, you're your most resourceful, creative, and you have the greatest ability to contribute to your own survival and that of the, the species. Mm-hmm. So when you really think about it, we've actually got a biological purpose for being here to be happy. That's our purpose. We're not supposed to be here with stress and problems. We're supposed to be happy because that gives us the greatest chance of surviving and thriving. So, of course, why we're not happy, why most people aren't happy, is a very interesting question, which I'll come to, (laughs) about how the brain works. But the the next thing you have to say is, okay, if my purpose is to survive and thrive, what has nature provided provided for me to enable that to happen? Mm -hmm. It must have given me something. It must have given me some tools or some resources to enable that to happen. That would be, from a biological perspective, a survival perspective, totally logical. And it turns out it has. It's given us a machine that is designed specifically to make sure that we survive and be the best that we can be or try to get us to be the best that we can be. And that is our brain. You know, our brain is literally a biological machine whose sole purpose is to make sure that you survive and thrive. And part of that is to make sure you're happy, make sure you're being creative, resourceful and doing and being your best. But none of us have ever understood what the brain is. We don't understand that although it's a machine, it's incredibly powerful. It's far more powerful than any computer system that exists on the planet. But it is still just a machine, and it works in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. 
And the funny thing is, I thought, well, why has no one ever taught us how to use this machine the right way? Because any other machine you can think of, you wouldn't dream of using it until you'd been taught how to use it. You yeah. know, for instance, a motor car, you know that a motor car is designed to get you from where you, it only has one purpose. It's to get you from where you are to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And it will do it efficiently, easily, enjoyably for you, you know, with no problems, predictably. That's its job. So you don't have any doubt that a motor car will do that for you. But you also know that you can't just get in and look at all the levers and buttons and things and get it in, get it working right if you haven't been taught how to drive it. Mm, very true. It, it's it's to totally logical, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yet here we have the greatest machine that's ever been invented with a specific purpose to get us to anywhere we want to go. And we're like, we're sitting in a car looking at all these things and nothing's happening or if if we if something is happening it's it's not not very pleasant it's a bit yeah. like a motor car you might get into the car and you might say well i've no clue on what this is or how to drive it but i see it's got wheels oh perhaps the way to get it to where i want to go is to get out behind from behind and push it so you get out behind and you put in all of this enormous effort and you're motivated and you're determined yes i will achieve this goal i will get to where i've where I've decided I want to go. And you're putting in all this effort, but the car, if, if it's moving at all, because you you might have left the handbrake still on, <laughs> so it's not going to move, <laughs> you're going to put in all this struggle, and what's going to happen? It's not going to be enjoyable, and you're going to create problems for yourself. You're going to wear yourself out with stress mm -hmm. and exertion, and you're not going to get anywhere. True. And if you get anywhere, it's it's going to be very uncomfortable. And, of course, what most people do then when it comes to the brain, as they say, well, the problem is I'm not trying hard enough. I'm not motivated enough. I'm not strong enough. I need to work on building up my muscles so I can push that car harder. But if they only realized that all you need to do is figure out how the car actually works, and then it's going to take you, it's going to do its job. It's going to get you to where you want to go. And this is what I've discovered about the brain, is that it is designed to get us to where we want to go in an enjoyable way. Because what is a problem? A problem is a sign that you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. It's the same with a car. If you drive it the wrong way, you're going to get problems. The car is going to develop problems. <laughs> you know, the engine might blow up or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is how I started to really get into un understanding, well, how the brain works and, and really create, a, if you like, an instruction manual to describe how to use it. Because when you use it the right way, as I said earlier, it's going to do its job for you easily, enjoyably, predictably and all you need to do is play your part to go along for the ride and and that's how, what it's designed to do mm. and any problems in your life are really a sign that you're not using the you're not using this machine the right way wow interesting is it yeah 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 it really is mm. nice so you so how it works okay <laughs> well there's lots of technical <laughs> terms but essentially I've broken this model down into the brain has four parts. Mm -hmm. And these are all in different physical locations in the brain. You know, these aren't just ideas. These are actual physical locations that science has identified that this is the function of that part of the brain, okay. if you like. Mm -hmm. But rather than use the technical words, my, my, what I teach is a simplified version. So the first part of your brain is the thinking brain. And this is the part of your brain that's actually located on the top of your head, and it's quite a large portion. But the purpose of this part, or what this part actually does, is that in every moment of your life, it takes in all of the information for your, from your environment, and that's through your five senses, you know, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, taste, and touch. It takes in all of that experience, all of that information, and, all of the, and also all the information that, that you um, take in from your thoughts, mm -hmm. and it stores it in this part of your brain. So it's like a big library or a big database of all of your past experience. Everything that you've learned and experienced in your life is stored in this part of your brain, in the thinking part of your brain. Mm, okay. So that's the first part. It's like a library. Mm. The second part is your emotional brain. And this is actually physically located just underneath your thinking brain in your head. And this obviously is where your emotions and feelings come from. So this part of your brain is responsible for making you feel certain ways. And that can be everything from good, you know, like loving, grateful, um, joyful, all of those things, to feeling bad, 
stressed, afraid, worried. That's all controlled by your emotional brain. And it does that without getting too complicated, but it communicates those feelings through, through chemical, releasing chemicals, which we might have heard of as being called hormones, but they're more correctly called neurotransmitters. So they transmit information through, in the form of feelings mm -hmm. to, the, to your body, and they make you feel a certain way. All right, so, and the third, so the third part, that's the second part, your emotional feeling brain. The third part of your brain is your survival brain, and that's at the back of your head. And this is the part of your brain that takes care of all of the functions to keep you basically alive, basically, you know, surviving, as the name suggests. So it's not about your thinking. It's all the things you do when you're not thinking, like breathing and your heart beating and your organs all functioning the way they're supposed to, you know, all of those things. So this is your survival brain. But there's a really important, another part of your survival that this, this part of your brain takes care of. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about, this is a crucial thing to understand, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention it now and we'll talk about why it, and how it works um, in a moment. But, and this is, this is the part of the instinct, if you like, that's sometimes called your fight, flight, or freeze instinct. It's your survival response. And the way this works is, your brain is, is busy bringing in all this information and your emotional brain decides is making a decision in every moment of your life whether the information coming in is safe or dangerous. In other words, is your environment safe mm -hmm. or is there something that could immediately hurt you or kill you right now? And what that does, if, if everything's safe, it, it releases a signal through chemicals to make you feel good. If it sees that something is dangerous, it releases chemicals that make you feel fear, worry, anxiety, stress, and it, and it activates something in, this, in the survival part of your brain called the sympathetic nervous system, which gets you to react and fight back against an immediate threat or danger. So wow. the classic example is, for instance, you know, in prehistoric times, because this is essential for survival, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine you're, you know, in the caveman day, caveman days or whatever <laughs> something going the down lion is, yeah. the lion is running at you from out of the out of the jungle now and you and your brain instantly says danger it activates your sympathetic nervous system flicks you into fight flight or freeze and without thinking you react to the danger so you're either going to run away or you're going to stand and fight or you might shout out for help whatever it is it's just a response to this danger and this is a really important part of our survival because obviously, you know, you don't want to be thinking, you don't want to start thinking about how to solve that danger because that would be too slow. It would take too long. You need to be able to just react. I'm sure we've all been in that situation where you find you're just self just reacting. Mm -hmm. You know, someone raises their hand at you and you automatically shield your eyes or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's all your survival, this survival instinct switching on to deal with an immediate danger. So that's the survival brain. Mm -hmm. And the fourth part of your brain, which science is relatively recently starting to realize is a separate part of the brain. It's located in separate places and it has a different function. And this is what I call the creative brain. Now, this, the creative brain is really interesting because this is where you get your creativity from. It's where you get your ideas. It's where you get your gut feelings about things, you know, when you say, mm, I'm not sure about that, or I'm not sure about this person, or, or op on, the, on the opposite, you say, yeah, that's, I, I feel really good about that person. They're not actually your feelings, it's coming from a different part of your brain. It's coming from like an, a knowingness, if you like. Mm -hmm. But the creative part of your brain also contains things like your big picture awareness of things. It's when you get new ideas and different ideas and better ways to do things. And Funnily enough, it's also the part of your brain, because remember I said the brain is almost infinitely powerful, so, and its job is to make sure that you survive and be the best that you can be. In other words, be the happiest that you can be. So on a low level of awareness, we see things like luck, coincidence, chance events, synchronicity. We see all those as random events, but they're not actually random. They are actually the activity of this part of your brain, the creative part which is actually literally brings to you the right circumstances, the right people, and the right events to help you to make sure that you're living, being the best you can be, be the happiest that you can be. This is all handled by your creative brain. The creative brain. And the interest, yeah. Mm. 
And the interesting part is, this is the way we're supposed to live all of the time. The way, you, the way you're supposed to use your brain the right way is when it's run by your creative brain. Because that's when you make the right decisions. That's when you, when you, if you have a problem show up in your life, you can see exactly the right answer. And not only that, this part of your brain also controls your motivation. So when you see the right thing to do, you will do it. And this has been, it, this, it controls all of these things, your creativity, you know, um, musicians, composers, writers, artists, they all talk about this creative side where, you know, musician, he's, he hears the music and he writes it down. He doesn't know where it comes from. They all describe this. And this is all coming from this part of your brain called your creative brain. So it's where all of your, re really all of the resources are to enable you to live the life you're supposed to live being happy and being your best. Wow, man. Well, there's a problem. So this is the way we're supposed to live in this creative state all the time. Feeling, in other words to describe it, a feeling in the flow, in the zone. And it's when you're feeling good. And science has a word for this as well. And it's a state of homeostasis. And what that means is the perfect functioning of the organism. This refers to all life. But when you're in homeostasis, when you're functioning perfectly on a physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional level, you are using your creative brain. And that's when you're feeling good, you're happy, you're grateful, you're loving, you're contributing to others, you're contributing yourself, you're doing all the right things to make you happy and therefore contribute to your own and other people's survival the best. But there's only one, so that's what we, and I, I call this our natural creative state. That's the way we're supposed to live all the time. That's the way we're mm -hmm. designed to be, you know, mm -hmm. biologically. But there's one time you're not, when you're not supposed to be in that state, and that's when the lion runs out from the, from the forest. In other words, when you're presented with an immediate threat to your survival, something that suddenly comes out of nowhere and is threatening to hurt you or kill you. And it could be someone running at you or holding a gun to your head or, um, you know, a, a car veering off the road and coming in your direction. And these are all immediate threats and dangers to your survival. Then the survival so brain you, kicks in. Exactly right. So what the, the emotional brain does, it sends a message. You've got an immediate threat to your survival. Make you feel fear. And fear is the signal to get that survival brain kick in mm. and react and deal with that threat, deal with that danger Get rid of it as quickly as possible, whether running away, fighting, shouting, whatever it is. Get rid of it so you can get back into your natural creative state. But there's a big problem here, and this is the fundamental problem with, unfortunately, why most people are using their brain the wrong way and why they have problems in their life. The problem is when you're in that, in that survival state and you know that you're in the survival state when you feel fear, worry, anxiety or stress, that's a sign that your brain is telling you that there's immediate, an immediate threat to your survival. But the problem is most people live in that state most of the time, even when there isn't an immediate threat to their survival. Oh, wow. There is no lion about to eat you. But the problem, what happens is one of the things that happens when you're in that state is all of those resources of your creative brain are shut down because they're of no use to you to deal with an immediate threat to your survival. You know, if the lion really is running at you from the jungle, you don't want your brain saying to you, well, just stand back and let's maybe think about this. Is this a real danger? Let's come up with a strategic plan with all of the options on how we might deal with this. And, right. and by the way, while we're doing it, don't forget, you'd still live in a beautiful world with, look at the flowers on the, on the ground here and the way the trees are in this forest. Your brain cannot let you do, think any of those things because you'd be dead. <laughs> so it has to block off all of that from your awareness mm -hmm. and get all of your resources, everything physically, mentally, and everything else focused on instinctively getting rid of that immediate danger. But the funny thing is all of your problem solving ability, all of your resourcefulness, all of your creativity, your imagination, your big picture thinking, your gut feelings about things, your ability to bring the right people in, in, in situations to you, you don't have resort, access to any of that when you're feeling stressed. And that's why you can never solve problems when you're in that stressed state mm -hmm. because you're trying to use a part of your brain that, that, that is blocked access. off. Yeah. Yeah, you can't access the problem-solving part of your brain. And what do people do? Well, unfortunately, most people, they struggle like I used to do. 
and they get stressed and they try and do more things and they set bigger goals and they try and learn more stuff and they try and they focus on fixing, trying to fix their problems, but they're using the part of their brain that can't fix the problem. They're blocking themselves off from the part that can. And so the essential thing to understand with all of this is obviously that's using the brain the wrong way. And that's why if you're in a state of stress, fear, and worry, anxiety, you're never going to be able to really put your life together in the way that it's supposed to be put together because you're not accessing the resources that are there to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, how is it that we eliminate this fear and stress? Well, that's the trick, isn't it? That's the, <laughs> that's the key. <clears throat> yes, it is the key. I think the first thing, the, the first thing to realize is that is that most people, you know, when I, this is why I teach this, because most people think, well, that's a nice idea, but I can't eliminate fear and stress. You know, I've, look at my life. I've got all these problems. I've got all these things that are going wrong. It's all very well for you, <laughs> they say, or they might say. <laughs> um, see, it's easy for you. But remember, you know, I, I've been there. I've been homeless. I've been in a, a state of desperation. So I know it can be done. But the first thing to realize is this is the way your brain works. Mm -hmm. you have, so you have to accept that whether you like it or not, no matter what excuses you might make, you have to get rid of fear. Fear is, go is going to stop you from doing it because the same with getting in your car. You can get in and say, well, okay, um, I, I know that might be the way it works, but you don't understand me. I, I, you know, I'm going to do it a different way. Um, I'm going to be really motivated and I'm going to pray that the car drives itself. Um, and that'll be more more powerful than trying than using it the right way. None of that works. You have to use it the right way, no matter how motivated you are, no matter how determined, how how much you pray. If you use it the wrong way, you're simply using it. You're not going to get the result. So the first thing to accept is that fear is the enemy. Fear fear is like another example is if someone gave you a glass of hydrochloric acid and said, "Drink this," you'd say, "I'm not going to drink that. It's going to kill me. It's not going to be any good for me." They say, "Well, I'll give you a million dollars, and you'll be really happy if you do it." Hang on, what are you? Why are you saying that? You don't understand. It's I understand what it's going to do to me. This hydrochloric acid. It, no matter how much money you give me, or how much I might pray, or try and pretend it won't hurt me, it's going to really damage me if I drink this acid. So there's no way I'm going to do it. So it's the same with fear. It's like there's no way I'm, I'm going to do, well, I'm going to do everything I can to get rid of it because there's no way I realize, knowing how my brain works, that no matter how, whatever else I think, it's going to damage me. It's going to stop me from being the best version of myself. It's going to prevent me from being truly happy in my life and living a life where I feel in control without problems. So the first thing is to, to absolutely acknowledge, and that only comes from understanding, really, about how the machine works, Acknowledge that fear is the enemy. And, and really what I teach in my coaching programs, <clears throat> excuse me, is the first step is to understand that. And the second step is to say, well, if I know that, what am I putting in my life that's making me feel afraid? If mm. fear really is the poison, fear is the toxin, fear is what is the blockage, what, what am I doing? What am I allowing into my life that's making me feel afraid? Doesn't matter what it is or how justified I might feel mm -hmm. that I should have, have this experience. So it's making you feel bad. It doesn't matter how justified you might feel or significant you might feel that, that it is. It's not. Because here's the other interesting thing. When you're in your creative brain, you see things in a different way. And what seemed to you to be really important when you're in that stressful state is no longer important because you see the truth. You see the big picture. Because remember, your brain in a fearful state sees things only as the negative. It's only looking out for the negative. And it sees everything mm -hmm. that is far worse than it actually is. That's what it's designed to do. It's designed to pick out every single negative thing in your environment because it might be something that's going to kill you there and then that you've got to react against. So this, after understanding how this all works, you really need to start saying, I've got to do everything I can to stop things that are making me feel afraid come into my life. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that, that if the lion is a lion coming at you, of course you, you feel afraid in that situation or you're walking off a cliff or, you know, you, you are going to feel fear when there's an immediate threat or danger. But if, I'm sure if we really think about it, why we allow, we choose to put things into our mind that make us 
feel fear, feel fear, feel anxiety and stress and worry. We allow that to happen. So we turn on the TV and we watch the news and it makes mm. us feel about some war or some calamity or, you know, some disaster. And it makes us feel bad. Or we talk to somebody and we have a so negative true. conversation. Mm -hmm. Or we talk, we we're, uh, surround ourselves or uh, engaged with a negative person, someone mm. who... So anything that makes you feel bad, there's a lot more, a lot more other things that people aren't aware of, but these are obvious ones that are make, and you've got to say, this is blocking me from living my best life. So it doesn't matter what it is, if it makes me feel bad, I've got to try and eliminate it from my life. And that means turning off the TV, getting out of the habit of, and it is a habit, obviously they're all habits. A and lot of people don't even realize that they are you know, bringing these things on, you know, and after they finish watching, they feel some type of way or after they get off the phone with a friend or conversation that they're feeling some type of negative way. It's true. We have to, mm. you know, just start trying to be aware that these things are around us. So that way we can start exactly. making some changes. And mm. the reason we're not aware of it, we don't think it's important. We think, oh, well, you need to keep up to date with world events. And I need to talk to this person. We don't, we're not aware of what it's doing to us, how it's preventing us from being the best that we can be and from living a happy life, which is our purpose. And our brain is this machine going, will you please get out of the way, stop being in this fear state so I can operate properly and give you all of the things that are going to make you contribute the most in a happy way to yourself and to other people. Mm -hmm. but it, you know, it's, it can't, <coughs> it's a bit like you're sitting in your car and you've got the accelerator on full and you've got your foot on the on the on the brake, the other foot on the brake as well. You ain't going at the same time. <laughs> Just no, making some noise, very, right? <laughs> yeah, and eventually the engine blows up and right. you wonder why that happened. <laughs> right. Oh wow. Wow, this is powerful information. So do you think you know, that, that um I know you have recommended the saying that setting goals is unnatural and sabotages your success? Can you give us a little more information into that? Another controversial statement, isn't it, that we've all been taught? <laughs> yes, of you course. You know, goals. set goals. Everybody, setting goals yes. is important. Everybody, and, you know, get your yeah, goals and together. And you will achieve them. Yes. That's right. And that's what it's all about. Well, here's the funny thing. I, I thought about this for, because for years I set goals, and I, I went to goal-setting workshops and, you know, sit down and figure out what you want and write it down and, create a plan to achieve it and all of those things. But I think if people are, are really honest, they will agree that very, very few of the goals that you actually set for yourself, you ever achieve. And you spend all this time trying to achieve them. And it was the same for me. I didn't really achieve many of the goals that I did. And some of the things I did achieve weren't on my goals list. But <laughs> the, the problem with, <laughs> the problem with, uh, with goals is, again, it's using the brain the wrong way. And, and there's actually two types of goal. There's a goal where you just know something is going to happen. So for instance, you might meet somebody and you look at them and you go, I'm going to marry that person. And you don't know why you're thinking that, but you, you just know it. That's kind of like the knowing, so, right? That's a knowing goal. Correct. And the other type of goal is a wishing goal where you hope something will happen because if it does, then you'll feel happy or, the, or you think that you'll feel happy. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to achieve something and, it, and, and those are the goals that we never achieve because they, they're from stress, trying to, um, trying to achieve something through struggle. But here's the thing. When you set a goal, what you're actually doing in your brain is you're taking your thinking brain, which, remember, has got all the information about your life, mm -hmm. the knowledge that you've picked up, and you're trying to use that to figure out what you want. But that doesn't know what you want. That's not the part of your brain that's designed to know what you want. Mm. That can only tell you what you think you want. So you go, you, you, it, it, if you ask it, what do I want? It's going to go, well, what do other people want? What do other people, what does success look like? Mm. Oh, you know, there's a piece in your brain that you've read somewhere that people who are millionaires are happy. Okay, right. you need to be a millionaire. Or you need to be married or have a family or, yeah. Yeah, or you, or you need to fix this marriage that you're in. Or because, you know, everybody knows that you can heal your marriage and, and feel great and overcome all the challenges. These are all the things you need to do. But that's not what that part of the brain is designed to do. It doesn't have the answers. It, 
to what you need to be truly happy. That's in your creative brain. And your creative brain knows far more than your thinking brain does about you. And it knows what you want. It knows what you need. And it knows how to get it for you. Hmm. So the problem, that's why goals really, if we're really honest, they generally don't work. Unless you have a knowing goal that comes from your creative brain, which says, okay, that house, that person, you're supposed to have that. And then you know on a deep level, but you, those goals you don't have to struggle to achieve. It's so true. You, you know, you, you have to put in some effort, but you do tend to do the right things and, tend, and things tend to fall into place. I remember a few years ago, I walked in, I was looking at my wife at the time and I were looking for a house. And I had a bit of an idea about what sort of house I'd like. And I walked into this house and there was just a part of me which said, you are going to buy this house. Now, the price was three times what our budget was. Wow. But we, but I just knew, I, don't, I said, and it was a little bit of fear thinking, oh, this is freaky because I'm going to buy this house, but I'm a bit worried because I have no clue how we're going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the price, that's ridiculous. And, um, but we did buy it and things just fell into place. And for years afterwards, I still kept trying to figure out where did we get the money for that? I have no clue as to where we got the money for it. Mm, but it we did. That's an, an example. It was meant to be. And that's the creative brain at work. The creative brain knows more about you than you know about yourself or than you think you know about yourself. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we don't use that when we're frantically sitting down trying to figure out what we want and, oh, I need to get this to be happy and I'm going to do my affirmations a hundred times a day that I am a millionaire and I, you know, I have this and I have that. Mm -hmm. that that's why it doesn't work is because you're not using your creative brain, the knowing part. You're using your fear-based brain which is very, very, which limits your your ability to the survival part of your brain. Basically. So, what should we do instead of setting goals? What would you recommend for people to do? The most important thing you can do is to learn about how your brain works, because when you do, what what comes with understanding is trust. It's a bit like a car. When you get in and you know you're using it the right way and you know how it works and how it's designed to get you to where you want to go, you don't worry about it. You don't get out every five minutes or five seconds, open the door and, and just see if, you're, if it's still working properly. Mm -hmm. You just let it do its job. And that only comes from understanding how that car works. And you, so you totally trust that the car that is going to get you to where you want to go if you drive it the right way. Okay. So when you understand your brain, then you can actually trust hmm. and you can trust it. You go, I, this is how it works. I know how it works. So I know it's going to bring me, I don't need to set any goals and worry about it. I know it's going to make me do the right thing at the right time. Sometimes it might even might not appear that I'm doing the right thing at the right time, but it's always going to be the right thing. Hmm. If something seems like a mistake, it's not really a mistake. It's just my creative brain leading me perfectly in every direction, yes. in the right direction. Hmm. You don't, so you don't need to worry about it. By understanding, you know, it says this in the Bible. You know, the Bible's a great instruction manual on how you how to use your brain, but most people don't interpret it that way. <laughs> That's true. It says in the Bible more than three hundred and sixty times, "Be not afraid, have no fear, have faith." Hmm. It's telling you how to use your brain the right way. It says, "Give no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself." All that's right. the opposite to setting goals, by the way. <laughs> and yeah, that's that because means being that's in the way present. your brain works. So yes. Exactly. Because tomorrow in that context is not when the sun rises tomorrow morning. It's every moment after this moment is mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yeah, that's true. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Just do the next thing that comes along. The next thing that shows up It'll, and trust that this machine is taking you where you're supposed to go. Mm. And uh, that's the beauty of it. And that's what happened to me. And this is what happens to people when I coach them on this, when they learn to use their creative brain rather than their fear brain to, you know, make their life work, as it were. One is, a, one is trying to make your life work, and the other is allowing your life to work. It's yeah, a there's difference. a difference. It's so true. It's so true. It is so true. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that, um, have you been able to share this with your family members, the people who are closest to you? Do they understand your work? Are they also following in these steps as well? Um. Uh, Pretty much. I mean, my, my family, um, I'm on the other side of the world from most of my family. I'm not really in touch with my siblings, but I have a very understanding partner who shares the same philosophy and oh, that's has, awesome. has, has, has been the person who has uh, 
you know, be my offside coach as it were as I've developed all these <laughs> ideas. I've tested all the ideas on with with many hours of talking. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah. You want to be able yeah, to share so, this with someone, you know, a partner or someone, because then, you know, it's not just you on this journey. I mean, of course, you're meeting lots of people and you're educating them as well. But it's nice to be able to feel that someone is with you on that journey. So that's nice to hear that your partner is as well mm. um, believes. Well, and, well the, beauty, well. the beauty of it is, is when you start using your brain the right way, the right people show up in your life as well. It's that, it's, so really it's like a right lot people. of attraction, right? Exactly. Right. But it, it's the law of attraction explained because the problem with the law of attraction is, again, people are trying to attract things based on fear. Yes. And that's they're why the wrong they're, things are coming. <laughs> that's, that's why the wrong it doesn't things work. Are up. Yeah. That's why it doesn't work. You've got to trust. You've got, and trust only comes not from faith because if you say, yes, I believe in God and God will give it to me, you don't believe it. You're trying to believe it. <laughs> and there's a big difference. So, so trust only comes from understanding. Yes. Like you trust the car. You tr- when you understand how it works, you trust your brain mm-hmm. when you understand how it works. And then the right people show up and you find that they're wrong people, if you like. I mean, in my stressful days, I had some very stressful relationships because I was, it was all based on fear. I was attracting all the wrong people, both personally and in business. Mm-hmm. But once I started doing this, I attracted the right person for me. And you have to trust that your relationships are going to work out. You know, you don't need to try and convince other people. So the true. right people will show up and the wrong people for you are going to fade away in your life. And that's fine. That's the way it should be. Mm-hmm. You don't attach any fear to that, any, any prejudgment. You just allow your life to unfold, which is really the natural flow of everything. If you watch a bird, I really recommend this to people, go out into your garden or wherever and just watch a bird for a few minutes. Hardly any of us have ever done that. I've spent any time in nature really looking at what's going on. And what you see in nature is there's no struggle. There's life and death, but everything is work, working absolutely perfectly. A bird is doing everything it needs to do in every moment to be the bird. It flies at the right time. It finds some food at the right time. Whatever it does, it's perfectly in harmony with its environment, and its environment is bringing it, it everything it needs. And we're the only ones who use our machine the wrong way, so we create problems. But there's no real problems in the natural world. Mm. Wow, that's nicely put. That's the way we need to be. (laughs) Right, right. Do you feel that you're living your purpose, that you're working in your purpose now in life? Yeah, I I do. And um, all of this that I'm sharing is what really excites me. And I realize there's such a... I guess everything, I've been very, very fortunate. I've had so many um, things happen in, in my life that I've been able to put a lot of things together mm-hmm. and to come up with with this, um, with this these ideas and share them with other people. So that's what motivates me and, and what I enjoy. It's, in other words, I'm living in my creative state, mm. being happy and oh. doing what I feel I'm supposed to be doing in every moment. <laughs> hey, that's it, right? That's, that's, that's pure joy right there, definitely. Yes, nice. Can I ask you, what color represents who you are at this point in your life in 2022? If you had to put a color to it, what would you call it? Yes. Ah. Well, I don't want to think about it because that's coming from the wrong part of my brain. So I'd say blue. Okay. Okay. Um, And you chose blue because it's your feeling or it's something that you... I don't know. It just came out. Yeah. Okay. Do you wear blue a lot? Um, yes. Oh, yes, I okay. do, actually. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And I live on the water, so this, that's pretty See, blue. See, look at that. There it is. There will be some, some things to, catching on that. Are you wearing blue today? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Just Caught checking. <laughs> Yeah, you caught me out on that one. <laughs> no, I mean, you would have got me if you'd have been like, well, actually, Chris, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I cannot tell a lie. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, where do you see your work five years from now? Um, can you tell me some hope or some desire that you would like to see where it will become? 
I don't. I give no thought for tomorrow. Okay. I don't know where. I have no expectation about where my life is going to be five minutes from now. You know, wow. it's interesting. I in my own podcast, or one, I have two podcasts: one on marriage and relationships, and one on all this stuff with the brain. And I interviewed a man. I don't know if you've heard of him called Ken Roberts. He wrote a book a few years ago called A Rich Man's Secret. Okay, no. I... And he was a very successful businessman in the 1990s. He built up the largest company in the world at that time, training people on um, on trading the, the markets. And he had a, a million customers. He had two private jets. He had all 50 or 500 staff. And a really interesting guy. And he said, you know, Liam, I never plan my life more than about four minutes ahead. That's the furthest ahead, I think. And he wrote this book called mm. Rich Man's Secret. And the Rich Man's Secret is take the next step and the next one will be revealed. And mm. really what he was talking about was exactly what I'm talking about. You need to trust and know that wherever you're going is going to be the right direction. You don't need, to, you can't know what's going to happen in five years time. You can't, you can't. Mm. And all you need to think about is how can I stay in this creative state and, and allow the, the wonder of this adventurous life to show up? Mm, okay. So basically we're like, not trying to see what's going to come, just taking every moment and every step by step. Yes, because it's like what we're saying about setting goals, isn't it? You you can't know what's going to happen. You can't know what's best for you in the future. That's it's not the purpose of your 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 purpose is not to know. Your purpose is to enjoy right now. Mm, you know, your brain is okay. saying to you, or whoever's saying to you, infinite intelligence is saying to you, look, just enjoy your life. The right things are going to come to you at the right times. Don't worry about it. If you worry about it, you're using the brain the wrong way and you're going to mess things up. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I see. I see you. I see you. <laughs> but you know, it's hard because way of looking at it, but... it is a very different way of looking at it. Um, and then when you've broken it down this way, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but um, I do try to be in the moment and I try to be present where I am and doing what I am. But I still do have hopes for the future. I do have things that I want to happen and desires that I want to get to if they fall the way that they fall that's fine i haven't planned how i want them to be but i just do have some things that i would like for myself to see for the future if they happen the way they happen that's great if they don't happen at all then like you say it's it wasn't meant for it to be um but yeah it's kind of hard to just give up everything for living now in the moment i'm here present but i'm not thinking about the future but i have things in place that i would like to have if that makes sense sure <laughs> oh for sure but the funny thing is you know when you when you actually let the future take care of itself which is again what it says in the bible mm -hmm. what you find is you're a lot more productive in the present moment because you're 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 focused on what do I do now? You yes. don't even need to ask yourself that question. You find yourself doing the right things. And it might take you in a direction you didn't know you were going to go in. So true. But, but you, that's when you, this is when you're in the flow, which, as I mentioned earlier, when you're in the zone, zone when you're being creative. You're, so people sometimes say to me or they think, so if you're just focusing on, on now and you're not thinking about the future, you're not going to be very motivated. You're not going to do anything. The opposite is true. Well, you actually end up doing less, but what you do is far more effective because you're not doing the wrong things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I think back on my previous life and so much of my time, so many of the problems that I had were based on decisions that were wrong. I should never have decided to to set up that part of the business or employ that person or marry that person <laughs> or get in a relationship with them <laughs> or whatever. And so I had to spend all this time trying to fix it. And if I'd really realized that the reason I'm making this decision is because I feel and it's when I'm in a state of fear and anxiety, it's going to likely be the wrong decision, then how unproductive is that? You know, you want to actually not have that burden around your neck that's taking you backwards. You want to just do things that move you, move you, forward. move you forwards. And, yes. And all of the work that I'm doing now, you know, I've written lots of books, I've done programs. You know, I couldn't have done all of all of this stuff. I, I do them in a very um, in the flow way. So I don't sit down and say, "Right, I'm going to. I need to write a book and never finish by the end of end of the month." I might wake up at, at five o'clock one morning and sit down and write ten pages of a book, hmm. 
or on Saturday night at 11 o'clock, I might suddenly get an idea, and that's when I'm off and I, and I develop it into something. And that's how you become efficient and effective. And rather than worrying and being stressed and thinking I need to, to achieve this, mm-hmm. just to allow the right things to be achieved for you. It's a lot easier, more effective, and it's the way you're designed to be. Mm. I'm not saying you, I'm, you know, one. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Not, <laughs> yeah, this is not a coaching call. <laughs> Well, hey, it's speaking to everybody. I'm getting my tips in too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a definitely a different way of thinking about things, um, and just not trying to help ourselves so much. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, we just try to help ourselves get to whatever we're trying to do, and basically, that's you know, with that comes all the extra. So, just allowing things to well, naturally fall in. Well, if place. you knew that you had ex- access to if, if you went to a library and you said, um, what's the answer to this question? How do I do this? And the librarian said, read that one book. And you pick up the book and it's on a completely different subject, but that's the only book you could read. Mm-hmm. And you had to try and figure out what the answer was. And you saw all this vast library behind you. Wouldn't you say, well, why do I have to try and, why am I trying to find the answer in that one book? I don't when mm-hmm. I've got access to this vast library that's going to have the answer, it'd be far easier to use the library rather than this one book. So true. But when we use our thinking brain, we're using the one book, the book mm-hmm. that's of our life, to try and figure out what is in this vast library, which is in our creative brain. It's not in our thinking brain. So don't mm-hmm. use your thinking brain for what it's not designed to be used for. Mm-hmm. Wow. But that means not to think, except when obviously we use our thinking brain to when something comes along and you go, okay, I know this is something, a project I need to do, and so I need to put some parts to it together and, and implement it, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, there is a use, for, <laughs> there is a use, useful time <laughs> to do planning and, and all that. Like, but but most of the time we overthink things, and we we're we're trying to, we're trying to help figure ourselves. stuff out. Yeah, it's true. We're trying to help rather ourselves. than just allowing this infinite, this the, the part of our brain that is connected to an infinite intelligence our creative brain, that's the same part of our brain that actually brings all the events in our life anyway. We've, somebody once said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. <laughs> isn't that so true? That's a T-shirt. I love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, right? Right? Wow, Liam, this is great. What wonderful information. And it's such an eye-opener. We're just totally like just pulling that sheet off it's like wow i didn't you know i never thought about this that way but it makes sense Mm. and if you can look back where i can only look back from my life and see certain things it's like yeah you know you're right just was it coming from fear and because of that it was just not where things should be you know and Mm. when things are at a flow and naturally flow as they should be and you just step right into the next thing it is it just happens and it's like wow you know Mm. so I I know this experience. I've never put words to it or had anyone ever explain it so detailed and so well um, that it makes such great sense. Yeah, super. Mm. Look at you. Yes. We love it. We love it. Um, In closing, I like to ask all my guests this final question. Is your glass half empty or half full? My glass. Hang on, I have got some water here. I don't know. It's about two thirds. <laughs> I think well, I've been having a, a sip of water from time to time. <clears throat> is that the right answer? Well, it's whatever answer that you desire to give me. There is no wrong or right answer. <laughs> I well, love it that. Says it's probably. Is there a glass? <clears throat> there, there. Okay. Is mm. there a glass? That that's that's what we're gonna go with. Is there a glass? <laughs> Nice, okay. nice, 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 yeah. nice. Then that leaves that that wraps it right on up from what we've been talking about. I was wondering how you were going to answer this as well. I was like, what did he? What will he decide on that? <laughs> Is there a glass? Is there a glass? Yes, we love that. We love that. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? I guess my my main message and thought is just <clears throat> maybe consider the possibility that life isn't necessarily the way that you think it is Mm. and that all you need to do is find out how your brain works. Just, just look into what this machine is and 
don't take my word for it. I've tried to prove in this call that this is the way your brain machine works, but just do a bit more research. And if they want to listen to my podcast, I go into more detail about this and just prove to yourself that this is the way you actually work. And this is the truth because the problem is it doesn't matter what you think. The truth remains the truth. So that's the important <laughs> thing is to find the truth, isn't it? That was really good. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And if you're not sure, then convince yourself it's not true by doing But I think everyone owes it to themselves just to do a little bit of digging because what I've found is too is that most of us, nearly all of us, if we just did a little bit of digging into anything, we'd find out that what we've been told is simply not true. Mm-hmm. And you don't need to do much research, but you'll find it's not what we what we've been led to believe about who we are, what life is, how we work, how things work, is simply not true. But if you're prepared to spend five or ten minutes to investigate that, you'll you'll see for yourself that it, that it's not true. There's a different way we operate mm-hmm. that we've never been taught about, apart from in the Bible. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But we've never interpreted it in the right way, have we? That's Mm-mm. the thing. Yes, 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 yes. Um, can you tell everyone how they can reach you if they're interested to find out more about you as well as your podcast? Sure. Everything's on my website, which is just my name, liamnaden.com. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll find everything there. And actually, one thing I've got at the moment, I hope it's all right to mention this, but um, sure. if people want to have an experience from operating from their creative brain and see what happens rather than their fear-based brain i have an audio that they can download for free from my website which is called solve your problem and it's it's a, using a technique i've called neuro rebalancing so it's a neuro rebalancing experience mm. so if you've got a problem if there's something weighing you down just have a listen to this audio and see if it doesn't give you don't feel a shift into this creative part of your brain and find that you might get some some insights some better results to the problem you're facing Wow, that's awesome, Liam. Thank you for that. Definitely. And can you give the name of your podcast if they're interested to follow? I'm going to put all this information in anyway, but we just want to hear you say it. (laughs) It's called called Using Your Brain for Success. Yes, 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 yes. Using Your Brain for Success. And you also have a marriage, marital podcast Mm. as well. Yes, I do a lot of marriage and relationship coaching. This is how I really started to look at the brain in particular. So I have some, if people are finding problems in their relationship, um, that's called Growing in Love for Life, but it's also on my website. Okay, excellent, excellent. Mm. We can get everything from there. Thank you so much for taking some time out to be a guest here on Glass Half Full. We're so glad that we could have you you in today. Yes. It's been my pleasure. Oh, we really appreciate it, all of your insight and all this good information that we are now, I'm going to take a look at the site too. I want to try this out, this exercise that you mentioned. Definitely. And it's really left us thinking about how we should use our brain in a different way. What an awesome understanding that you gave us today. We really, really are so glad for it. Thank you again. Me too. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. You have a great morning. You too. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners listening in to another episode of Glass Half Full, a podcast and a safe platform for everyone to share their life experiences. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Levins. Please subscribe, follow, and rate this podcast on Apple Music and Spotify for more learning experiences. Until next time, know you are blessed. See ya!